Hello everyone, welcome to day 21 of the Regeneration History Marathon Advent Calendar Spectacular. Once again, I'm joined with Luke. Hey. Yes, you get to decide what you call this series, really. We've got quite a few different <laughs> names for it at this point. Uh, but yeah, today we're in the home stretch, aren't we, really? Nearly there. Uh, yeah, we've well, been the last 10 years so this is sort of like doctor who for us as almost adults when we first watched this i'd say edgy teen phase so, is yeah full swing. edgy te- yeah edgy team phase but we're getting there we're maturing and it's deep breath with peter capaldi as the doctor not even his second appearance in the show or even third actually technically yes. because yeah i mean he turned up in fires of pompeii as caecilius uh, you got a little bit of a line about that here, haven't you? About who? The whole story is about f- faces, isn't it? Really, yeah. about identity, veils hiding them and such. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very heavy with that. Mm. Yeah. But then you also turned up in Day of the Doctor, which we did about a week ago now, I think. Mm-hmm. And he also turned up in Time of the Doctor, of course. His, and uh... Torchwood as well. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Frobisher. As Frobisher, not the Penguin. We, we, we that would wish. have been a very interesting. I mean, that'd be a bleak ending, wouldn't it, for Frobisher? <laughs> <laughs> oh. I mean, you never. It could have been the Penguin. He's a shapeshifter. <laughs> oh it, no, 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 it's bleak. That's not a joke <laughs> on the back of a Penguin. No. Oh dear. Uh, well, I mean, Rob Sherman does like his uh, dark stuff. I, don't know if I think that's, quite that's that too far. dark. For... Uh, very nice. Uh, but yes, Peter Capaldi is here as the Doctor now, and he had a very different reveal, didn't he? Yeah, Doctor Who Live back in August 2013, so nearly a year, well, pretty much a year before Deep Breath aired, we were getting yeah, a glimpse was of about. Capaldi. Mm. It was it's... such a bizarre thing to do. Like there must have been so, I guess, because it was like the fiftieth anniversary year. Let's do this spectacular thing of make doing this really awkward live show. It's a bit like the fiftieth anniversary after party thing. It's kind of yeah. got that cringe element. You've got Zoe Ball there, Bernard it's Crimmins, like... Rufus Hound. It, oh, it's weird. Hmm. It's one of those things where, like, as a Doctor Who fan, it makes you feel embarrassed to be a Doctor Who fan if you're like watching it with family or something, or hear your friends talking about, it and you're just like, Ugh. it's sort of a skewed representation of how we see the fandom, at least, isn't it? How we see the show. Yeah, yeah, it's it, yeah, it's a weird one for sure. Yeah, I mean, you saw like, you had his hand first, didn't you? Like, right. yeah, and I mean, understandably, they save it right until the end. It's like a half hour. And about a two-minute interview with Peter Capaldi at the end as they hype it up, they reveal it. I suppose the closest we've got to it now would be uh, Millie Gibson's reveal on Children in Need. But it's sort of like that's part of a much bigger event. It wasn't just built around the one that was an um, That's an umbrella thing, really, for that big event, really, isn't it? Yeah, it's just like a nice little extra in there, isn't it, really? Hmm. Whereas this is all about Doctor Who for half an hour. I, mean, I, yeah, I don't think it, if... I don't think it did as well as like the Matt Smith one because the Matt Smith mm. one was wonderful because it was like a confidential and it talked about every single doctor up until David and then it was like and here's your new doctor which I think is a better way to approach it mm. yeah that's true yeah. and I suppose also maybe just because of the time as well because it was David leaving people were more watching that for that Hmm. Uh, perhaps um, but yeah it's funny how things have gone since then because with the Jodie reveal that was just like a short was that around Easter time that popped no, up? No it was at the Wimbledon um, finals ah uh, uh, yeah Back that was July. just like a short yeah that was a short little video attached to something else then and I mean that was a odd one I suppose the closest we come to this would maybe be Bill's reveal as well because that like had a short little almost mini so to it, didn't it? Yeah, that was like, was it like for a football final, like championship? Yeah, or I think whatever? so. I don't know. I'm, yeah, I remember being in a um, Premier Inn sat watching that. Ah, yeah, I can't. 
Uh, I can't quite remember what I was doing there, but yeah, it was some sort of either mini holiday or maybe parents had come up to see me at uni or so. I'm not sure, but yeah. I just remember that being where I watched that particular one. I don't know quite. I'm pretty sure I was just at home. It was just another mm. day for the um, Capaldi reveal. But yeah, and then with shooting at work, that was literally just a new story online. Yeah, it was just like an Instagram post, wasn't it? Yeah. Really? Um, but it, it just shows like the, the shift in media, the television landscape on how we consume this stuff. And obviously social media is where most people get their news from now. It's not yeah. the old telly I box. Mean, Particularly with Shooting Atwell himself being so prolific on social media, it made sense for that to be the case. Like he has so many followers on Instagram, doesn't he? Yeah, a couple of and million. So, yeah. So, you know, it feels right for that to be shared there. And, you know, naturally that brought in a lot of people from outside the Doctor Who sphere into it. Whereas this, with um, this event in particular, it's not going to really do that because it is a Doctor Who centred event it's not going to really draw in people who aren't necessarily at least casual viewers of the show mm -hmm. like I don't think old Bob down the street is just going to stick on Doctor Who live the next Doctor yeah you, <laughs> you're going to sit on the paper some, the next yeah. day or something yeah that's or, it really, all the 10 o'clock news hmm uh, but yeah Deep Breath Itself written by Stephen Moffat of course what trivia do we have for this one um well you have the blue peter competition i think this is like the last time blue peter's been heavily involved with doctor who i want to say hmm there's sort of been a long history between the two hasn't there yeah like um, going right back to i mean even the 60s you have mm. the dalek cake of course yeah uh, you've got yeah, I, can't... I suppose maybe because of how chris chibnall wants the show to be much more secretive yeah and sort of close that side of it off maybe that was why things didn't come in through blue pizza so maybe it'll change again now that russell is in charge yeah hopefully we can hope mm. so we have like strax's device uh vastra's like hairpin thing and then i'm trying to think what oh, jenny's, yeah. jenny's was i think Ooh. jenny has like a little device what she uses yeah, I can't quite remember what it was in the story. I think Jenny's is probably the least prominent in the story, given mm. that we cannot quite remember it off the top of our heads. Yeah. But yeah, I know what you mean now. Yeah, Vastra's mm. certainly little um, door lock. Was it like the binoculars? I don't know. Ooh, could be something like that. Who knows? Yeah, I don't know. Can't remember. Mm. Uh, but yeah, alongside this, you have uh, is it Brian Miller. Mm, yeah. husband of the late Elizabeth Sladen, father of Sadie Miller, uh, appearing as a tramp in this story. I think that's a lovely way of making sure that Liz is a part of an era in a way. Yeah, it, does, it feels right, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, he also appeared back in Snake Dance as well, so it wasn't his first time in Doctor Who. <laughs> yeah. Uh, of course, going back to the Paternoster gang, Madame Vastra gets to echo a certain uh, line from the Third Doctor era, doesn't she? Mm, with the brig. They're saying, yeah, well, here we go again. And it, it feels right having it be Vastra as well. I mean, I suppose we could talk about how in the writing process of this, Stephen Moffat approached it more like Robot, didn't he? Was the one he called back to a lot in saying that, you know, you've got a lot of returning elements from the previous era to help launch this new era and keep mm -hmm. people comfortable. Like in place of unit, you've got the um, Paternoster gang. In place of, uh, say, Sarah, you've got Clara, of course. And yeah, so it makes it a very different kind of regeneration story to what we're used to because it's set in the past as well. Yeah, which is nice. Think, yeah, it makes a change. And I think it's the only regeneration, post regeneration story set in the past, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Mm, so that's something a bit different as well. Uh, but yeah, any other little bits of trivia for us with this one? A couple of Matt Smith bits. Um, mm. You have the Doctor experience Matt Smith uh, mannequin's head being ripped off by Peter Capaldi. 
Yeah. I mean, is it worn by him for? A... Well, I imagine it's not him under there until he has to do the ripping off, is it? Yeah, yeah unless they did like a Tom Baker mommy thing go, go on, Peter, stick it on there. No, it's you. <laughs> yeah. If, if anyone was to do that as well, I think it would be Peter. Yeah, because like Peter. I think he just want the fun of it. Yeah, Peter and his day off days off would go and see like Daleks get blown up and stuff on like into a Dalek. So like he was living his best life. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing about Peter being cast, isn't it? It's how massive a fan he was. Yeah, the Anna, he, he's he's a proper one of us, like an anorak. Yeah, like he was calling out the um, web planet, wasn't he? <clears throat> yeah, and Mondasian Sidemen, because you know, I went and saw this in the cinema. Mm-hmm. It was like, yeah, because this is series eight is a weird time. Just like the big world tour. Um, yeah, you did. And... They were sort of like trying to piggyback <laughs> off the success of the 50th, weren't they? But yeah. to limited success. And you had like the, a Q&A, like an exclusive Q&A afterwards of like Peter, Jenna and Moffat. And, mm. you know, one of the questions was like, oh, if you could have, um, you know, a classic monster come back in like be do with like new effects. Peter's like Mondas and Cybermen and he got his wish, but that's a tomorrow <laughs> to cover and yeah. talk about those things. Yeah, we got those coming very shortly. Um I think was he also quite a big fan of the Axons as well. He wanted to face them again as well. I think the Pertwee era is where his love is because he was like, I want the Damons, Axons, mm. all that good stuff. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, one last bit of Matt Smith trivia. That scene, his little cameo at the end there, was recorded while he was doing Time of the Doctor. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, it's nice how it ties back into that when it happens, isn't it? Because you also get like that little flashback of Clara outside the TARDIS and she sees that the phone is uh, in use, or was it, has been in use. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So that's, it's nice how that works out. Yeah. But yeah, I suppose, do you want to take it away with the synopsis for this one? Yeah, I'll try and break it down as best as I can remember it. <laughs> so Go for it. I'll give we, you a hand if I can. Okay, we start off with a dinosaur, and it's in London in Victorian times. Hmm, what's a dinosaur doing there? So the Strad calls in the Paternoster gang, and they notice that the dinosaur seems to be coughing. And spits out the TARDIS, a very dignified entrance for our new Doctor. Um, it almost feels like we need like a little minisode, because I feel like that would be a great little minisode. Oh, it's them getting chased by a dinosaur for a little bit. Yeah. I mean, you've got a nine month or eight month gap there, haven't you? Yeah. Maybe that could have been a nice way to fill it with something. It does feel like there is a little bit of a born again missing in between Time of Doctor and this. Yeah, because like, how has Capaldi got a haircut? How's Jenna's hair gone massively like longer from when we last saw her? She <laughs> put her extensions in. I don't know. It, yeah, it's a weird one. Obviously, it's the magic of telly, but you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Fasanosta gang investigate. Um, Vastra's like, "Oi, put these down. These sonic lances, weren't they?" Yeah, they get, to sort they... of keep it in. In like an invisible cage, pretty much, isn't it? Yeah, so it doesn't wander off. Um, ultimately, it's, it's downfall. Um, so out comes our new doctor, Peter Capaldi, who's a bit flustered, you know, thinking, getting people mixed up, which is a great little scene. Um, it very much does harken back to Robot, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it really does. Has that quality to it. Um, and I love the idea of the doctor sort of the, a dinosaur thinking the doctor's flirting with because you know he's two thousand year old. <laughs> you know what's a dinosaur old as well? Yeah, there you go. There's a nice. I don't know why, but there's something quite pleasing to me about that. Oh, one line that always sticks into my head is from a bit later on when he's running towards it in his dressing gown, just going, "Oi, big sexy woman," which feels so That's... wrong for Capaldi. Yeah, but I swear, it makes sense to him, like post regeneration wise, where he is all, you know, all over the place, really. Yeah, he's not stripped it back to the, the minimalist doctor just yet, the magician. Mm. I swear, yeah, I suppose in that early scene, Strax looks a bit pissed off as well because the doctor's stealing his thing of confusing people, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Damn woman, boy. Oh. Um, yeah, so the doctor. <laughs> is getting a bit giddy thinking Clara was handles 
and he's like, right, everyone, let's take five, and we have our new title sequence, which designed by a fan. Interestingly, it was a. Uh, I mean, this should be in the trivia, really. It was done by somebody on YouTube as a concept, and they liked it that much. They're like, "Oi, we want that for the TV show. Could you do it for the TV show?" Yeah. I felt it. I feel like the fan concept might have even been better. Yeah, I think. I remember so. seeing it at the time. Better yeah. theme. <laughs> mm. um, yeah. I think it had more of a purpley vibe mm, to it as well, didn't it? Yeah, it did. Oh, yeah. It's not too bad, and it's nice that Capaldi got to stick with that all throughout his era. He didn't have a sudden change towards the end like Matt Smith did. But I think that for Matt shows like a distinct change in character and style of stories they were going for. Yeah, I suppose. So, although it was a change like halfway through a season. I mean, technically not, because it was a split series. <laughs> yeah, but still. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. Still an unusual one. I suppose it was like an attempt to give it something special for the 50th, really, wasn't it? Yeah. Even though it's not used in the 50th itself. But yeah. yeah, back to deep breath. What happens after the titles? So we go to a room. What is a bedroom? Mm. What are you only sleep in? Which baffles the doctor um, as they're trying to calm him down, get him to rest so he can properly, you know, recover from the process of regeneration. And oh, yeah. this is when Clara's getting a bit agitated going well it's not really the doctor you know he's brand new he shouldn't have gray hair and um lines on his face which i think is one of the things i dislike about this story is the way clara is mm. but i guess we're going i suppose it's the problem the of yeah it's the problem of before that she didn't have much of a consistent character anyway i th- I, think I think this is the last example of what the story needs clara will be yeah, and I suppose it's very much because it's trying to call out the fans who are against the Doctor being older, isn't it? Yeah. You know, she's very much there to be the surrogate for the audience. And in this case, you know, a new who audience is much more used to a young Doctor. And so it's sort of challenging that idea. But yeah, it doesn't quite work with Clara because she has obviously seen this old faces before. Yeah, which is the, where the problem lies, really. Hmm. <laughs> Um, so Vastra calms the doctor down because, you know, she hasn't got a silly voice. She's, she's Scottish as well. Um, mm. and he has a right to complain about things. Um, where we get the Vastra going, can you give me like the perfect, um, image of sleep? Um, and then we get the cartoon sound effect, which kind of rubs me up the wrong way. I can't say it hit me like a piano at all. Yeah, it's just... I, I just think it was really out of place, especially oh. what the story is trying to do tonally. Um, yeah, it's a bit all over the place tonally, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah. Heck. So this is when Vasha's like, it seems we have a stranger in our facility. So she's like, get fetch my veil. Um, and then we have like a big juicy scene about, you know, the doctor's face and who the doctor is. Um, while the doctor wakes up and starts drawing on the floor for some reason, I think. Mm. I think was he tried to work out how to get the dinosaur home? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. It just seems a weird thing to start doing to go, oh, this is a new gimmicky thing with this doctor. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, he didn't do much of it after this. I mean, it's a throwback, I suppose, to Patrick Troughton. He did a bit of that in uh, The mm. Ice Warriors and such. Oh, Macritary, yeah, but... I think it's better using like listen and stuff like that. But yeah. Um, so... I suppose one other thing in this story is we've got the doctor bed bound, mm-hmm. but not willingly so, have we? For a long. Yeah. Whereas <laughs> Christmas Invasion, which is sorry, probably the closest New Who story to this, mm-hmm. just because they're both post regenerations, but you've still got. You know, a companion from the previous era sticking around and supporting characters as well. Uh, and so with that, you have like the contrast between Rose and Clara in that Clara is the control freak here. I'm not sure how much of that was present in season seven, but certainly that seems to be the character trope they go for in series eight and nine. Uh, you know, you've got this control freak and a doctor who does not want to follow on with that, whereas 
with Rose, you had a companion who is somewhat more reliant on the Doctor. Yeah. Like, she can save the day in her own right as well, and has done so. But she sort of, she very much wants the Doctor to be there, doesn't she? Like, you know, she puts the Sonic in his hand and says, help me, to him. But instead, she's sort of stuck without him uh, for that bit. And so I think it's nice how those are contrasted there with the Doctor being much more active in this story. Mm. Yeah. yeah, speaking of him being active, what happens next? We get the do 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 do, which is so weird because like the music doesn't seem quite timed right with the scene with Capaldi's little jig. Hmm. Um, where we get yeah. a nice moment of like door boring, and then window me, um, and then off he goes <laughs> to chat to a big sexy woman. Um, he's not. It's that awkward fall through the tree as well that looks very fake. Yeah, where we see the dinosaur combust. Um, mm. which we find out the clockwork droid are back as we see the sinister half face man um yeah. taking somebody's eyes and i i think i like the half face man i think he's a cool thing with this story yeah um, there's that there is that wonderful scene and it's an example of <clears throat> moffat's very sharp dialogue isn't it where it's like you have very good eyes um because obviously you know the guy's just seeing the dinosaur from afar and he's saying oh the neck's not right that's what makes you know it's fake yeah um, but you know he's not actually complimenting on him him on his eyesight he's saying i want your eyes mm, yeah uh so then we get the doctor off to find the sort of cause of the the dinosaur's combustion um so we yeah. get a nice sort of asked... the doctor learning how to ride a horse you know or left sorry i've not learned these hands yet which i think is quite fun yeah and all that stem off to save the dinosaur from combusting isn't it they're a bit late <clears throat> Well, you actually see it on fire, though, don't you? Yeah, you see it catch fire, and then which by the time I completely they get to forget, the bridge. forgot yeah. actually happened. Um, but the Paternoster gang and Clara um, join suit, and this is where we get Planet of the Pudding Brains, and mm. the Doctor jumps into the Thames uh, because he's taken up the case. And okay. this is when Clara joins the Paternoster gang, and they try and find out what's going on. Um, as we find out that there have been human combustions. Mm. Yeah, similar murders. And we have the Doctor rummaging around, doing exactly the same thing, where he bumps into, bumps into Brian Miller, Miller's character because he's cold. He wants a coat. Uh, so he's like, give us your coat. Uh, and that's all wonderful stuff with Capaldi about with a face. Um, you frowned me this face. Mm. Yeah, it's really trying to go, oh, we've got to do something with the fires of Pompeii, Torchwood, which you kind of get it answered in. Uh, the the girl who died, woman who lived. Yeah, one of those. Yes. Yeah, uh, it's a girl who died, isn't it? Yeah. I and I can't say I'm really a fan of that. No, I, th I think it's idea. set up really well here. Mm. But even then, I don't think you really need it. No, 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 because you don't get Colin Baker going, hmm, why do I look like Amanda Maxill? It's very much a Stephen Moffat and Russell thing, isn't it? If they yes. want to explain why they're using the same actor again, whereas you should just happily use the same actor again. Like, yeah. I think there's a theory that in the world at the moment, there are seven people who look pretty similar to you anyway, mm. just because, you know, human gene variation can only go so far, I suppose. Yeah. And I mean, you've got actors like... Uh, who was? There's like two actors in The Hobbit who look surprisingly similar, aren't there? Yeah. I can't remember which ones they are exactly. It's the Legolas and Bard the Bowman actor. And I should definitely oh, remember Luke, the Legolas actor. Luke Evans and Orlando Bloom. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Like people are saying about how they look very similar. And so, you know, it's just the way it is sometimes. You just got to accept. And also, it is just a show reusing actors. <laughs> it's a TV show. You got to accept these things. You don't need every little detail explained somehow. Wow. You burst my bubble. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, they, Clara and the Doctor both discovered that there's a advert in the paper uh, about this restaurant, Impossible Girl. So they both meet at this restaurant, which I think this is when the story starts to real click into place, and mm. you see Twelve and Clara's dynamic unfold as the restaurant isn't full of humans; it's full of 
robots. And it's a creepy scene, isn't it? It's very creepy. Um, no children's menu, so they get sent down to the larder where they encounter the clockwork. Uh, the half-faced man and his sort of servants waiting um, to be activated. Um, yeah, like recharging, aren't they? <clears throat> yes, and something happens, and the doctor's like, "Right, let's let's go." Clara gets left behind, and we get this quite sinister scene with Clara trying to evade them. I think that's really well directed by Ben Wheatley. There's a wonderful line a bit before that, like when they're trapped, they use the sonic to escape, and the doctor comes out with okay. a Miss Amy or something, isn't there? Yeah, about the legs. Times like this, a Miss Amy. Yeah, yeah, it's lovely, lovely stuff like that. So Clara is captured, um, and you get a whole sequence about you know a flashback to a school about you know all oh, get you all excluded from the school, and this is her yeah. using the psychology of that going go on then do it kill me because you have to work backwards to get me to answer anything and it's courtney as well isn't it the yeah it's courtney it turns out <clears throat> killed a moon yeah well the That's caretaker a, isn't it first yeah Naked. i feel like character wise though you don't need the flashback to know no, that no, no. Would be rubbish at controlling a class <laughs> you just tell that by looking at her <laughs> all right okay <laughs> well, um, try not to put too much clara slander it's okay we're done with her after well we got a little cameo from her coming yeah. up but but there is one person that will always have Clara's back, and it's the Doctor. And mm. he's ready to destroy and blow up the space if he sees one thing that he doesn't like. And that includes karaoke and mime. Mm. Um, so Vastra and Gang arrive to the cavalry, and all hell breaks loose, and we get the half-faced man escaping in the skin balloon. Um, and the Doctor's there going, well... I'm going to have to kill you, so let's have a drink. And you get some great moral bits between the two. Yeah. Um, because, you know, these droids are trying to be far from a robot. They are trying to be human. And we get quite a sinister bit where we see the half-faced man literally just on the spire of Big Ben. Yeah, they get, like the hat floating down. Yeah. It is totally very much all over the place isn't it this story it is. we'll come to that we'll come to that um but you get some brilliant little bits before that like about the view what do you see it's rubbish mm. no I, I like to be down there with the people where everything's so big uh, wonderful like you can see that there are doctor defining moments of air and very yeah doctor, like you can see that 12 is forming pretty much of air mm. um but there's a real hard edge to 12 in series 8 which gets sanded down a lot um, so they return to Paternoster Row the TARDIS is gone and Clara's like well I better stay here um, and join join you but something tells Vastra that Clara's not going to stay as the Doctor arrives and gets a whole big speech about his 2000 year old and they go to Glasgow and go and get coffee but obviously mm. they don't actually get coffee and we see the return of the half-faced man in the promised land as this is a big thing for this series and we are greeted with Missy and mm. that's how this story ends yeah that's it isn't it then mm. next time trailer for Into the Dalek yeah alright so I mean how did you feel about this story then? Because we sort of spoke a bit about tonally, it's a bit all over the place. So should we start there? Yeah, shall we go for that? Yeah. Because certainly it's got some dark scenes and some dark ideas behind it with, you know, I love the idea of these cyborgs that instead of starting as human and augmenting themselves to be um, more machine, like, you know, the typical cyborg would be, these are instead starting off as robots, but then... You know, like human. as yeah as they need more spare parts and as mechanical spare parts aren't available they're instead taking them from humans yeah and it's it's going into the uncanny valley isn't it particularly like the um mm -hmm. scene in the uh, uh the, the restaurant, restaurant while they're eating their food or not quite eating their food mm. that one's particularly creepy and yeah, I mean, there's sort of a reference to Sweeney Todd, isn't there, even from the Doctor yeah. and Clara while they're down there? And it is, it's quite a Birkenhead Victoriana, well. yeah. It's a Victoriana 
idea, isn't it, of this like macabre gothic style that it's going for. Well, but like at the same time, it's got edge as well. Yeah, that as well with the clockwork droids themselves. Uh, but then it's also got a lot of weird comedy. Like you got the dinosaur as this big spectacle as well that doesn't quite fit that. You got like we said before the oi big sexy woman line and stuff. There's a lot of bits like that that sort of contrast with the darker side that this one's going for. And perhaps maybe at some point Moffat realised, oh wait, this is meant to be a children's program, isn't it? And so well, that, I had to. I, th- I think that was one of the big criticisms of Series Eight because it was in a later time slot. Yeah. The themes it was dealing with, especially when you get to like the Promised Land, mm. that whole idea. I mean, dark of, water that yeah, got a lot back. Don't didn't cremate that? me. Um, yeah, yeah, it's just a weird tonal thing because like you think, oh, we're moving away from this sort of whimsical fairy tale of the Smith era. Like there is a real night and day shift between time and deep breath. I think because like we've watched this pretty much back to back. Yeah, we haven't had an eight month gap here. No, and you really can see there's Moffat's trying to hard stamp going. This is a new era. This is a new tone. This is the direction of the show we're going for. Hmm. I swear, speaking of Moffat himself as well I think he was sort of probably already ready to leave at this point wasn't he I think Matt was like, his doctor and I think he should have probably gone with Matt to be honest hmm. I mean I suppose he had his whole season arc plan for Matt didn't he or like four series plan perhaps hmm. uh, because Matt leaving surprised him a bit didn't it and so he had to get Capaldi instead and cast a new Doctor so he had to wrap up all of his ongoing stuff with Matt other than um, one little bit the woman in the shop yes. that comes back here and then obviously becomes Missy so I wonder, I wonder if the woman in the shop was originally going to tie into Moffat's arc with the 11th Doctor a bit more somehow if Matt had stayed on another series hmm. yeah. if that would have tied into Trends Law perhaps maybe yeah someone involved with the silence would pair Clara and the Doctor up for some reason and continue that destiny trap idea that was going on there. Yeah, that would have been cool. But yeah, I mean, certainly Moffat was ready to leave for a while, but there was just no one to step in to replace him until Chris Chibnall came along. And even then, Moffat had to stay for Series 10 so that Chris Chibnall could finish up with Broadchurch. But yeah, with the 11th Doctor, it very much felt like Stephen Moffat had that plan for Matt Smith, didn't he? Mm. Whereas with Peter Capaldi, it does more feel like it's being made up as it goes along throughout the era, which is fair enough because, I mean, that's sort of how it was with David Tennant as well. That's just how the show normally works. But you think yeah, a... with uh, with the 50th, you'd have Finding Gallifrey. Yeah, and I think and I... that's the thing. Moffat, as I've said before, doesn't seem as interested in Gallifrey. Like, could you say as... the Promised Land was like the Doctor's, like, Gallifrey? And he's like, I'm not interested in it. You know, like you could read into it like that if you want. Yeah, I suppose that's one way to look into it meta textually. And I mean, Moffat did love his meta didn't he? Yes. But, but yeah, certainly. I mean, he was ready to leave with Husbands of River Song, wasn't he, as well? Like, he was mm. writing that as if it could be his last one. But it's funny how these things work out, really, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But back to Deep Breath. This is the final appearance of the Paternoster Gang in the show. Which feels, well, it was weird to think. They had a, a 12th Doctor book as well in like that first wave of 12th Doctor book, Silhouette. I've not read yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so you can see they were trying to push it there. Hmm. And certainly Big Finish for a while weren't quite allowed to use them fully, were they? They got hmm. Strax for Jaguar Lightfoot Strax. But it seemed like there was maybe something going on spin-off-wise potential at the BBC, but just never came about because the budget would be too high. Yeah, and there's a bit what I forgot with Strax. And obviously, Strax is like the the funny guy, you know, the mm. bit of light in the story. But there's a dark moment in the story where he's literally ready to commit suicide and pointing his gun. Yeah. And you're like, that this is really bit much. That doesn't seem very Sontaran either. No. Honest. Like, you think that'd be a shameful death. Yeah. I guess it is shameful because he's going to get destroyed by... You know, these want to be humans, but it's just, it feels so out of the story. It kind of takes you out of it. Yeah, it does a bit. I mean, also around that time, you've got the um, kiss between Vastra and Jenny, don't you? Which yeah, made a few, a few headlines. Yeah. yeah, which is 
it, it, out of context, people can get furious about it, but there's a logical reason in the story for it. If it I feel like it's all, it does feel forced, to be honest. Okay. Like the way it's sort of done telepathically as well, the way they say it. And it does feel like a bit of an awkward moment to me. I'm more just the thought that, you know, you have got a lesbian couple here. You don't need an excuse for them to kiss. You don't need to come up with this contrivance <clears throat> for them to kiss. Just have them kiss like any other couple and that'll be it. Yeah. yeah. Obviously not quite in that scenario. <laughs> no. But, you know, just in a <sighs> random scene, just have it there if you really want that in there. Hmm. I, don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it set the lizards among the pigeons, didn't it? <laughs> Definitely did. Uh, Definitely did. And I mean, I suppose it's worthwhile for that, really, isn't it? Just upsetting the uh, Tories. Yeah, upset the gammons. <laughs> yeah, that's it, really. Yeah, you can grow concrete or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, before we get too political. Let's... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what's your thoughts on the Paternoster gang? I... <sighs> I think this is probably like the best story. Hmm, I'd say so. They're an odd one, aren't they? Because they sort of came around fully formed almost. Like the Doctor had already met each of them separately anyway. And then when they come up, when they show up in the Snowmen, it almost feels like you've had plenty of adventures with them before, even though you haven't. You've had two Minnesotes. You had like House yeah. Tracks getting back to life and like the little prequel to the Snowmen. Hmm. And then they went big on them in Series 7B because you had Crimson Horror and they were in the finale, name of the Doctor. Mm. Yeah, but then they turn up here and then that's it. Like, there's no... I think Moffat definitely didn't plan this as their final uh, story, did he? No, probably not. It just ended up that way you know, with everyone, with the way that Series 9 and 10 panned out. They just didn't end up with a Victorian story to involve them in. But I, I think as they don't really fit what the era is going for I feel like it does in a way with the um, darker nature of this story in particular I I don't know because I feel like it again going back to that robot thing Paternoster being unit you you kind of have that break away from it mm. that's out of a bygone era now Capaldi that stamp our no frills no nonsense doctor you know hmm I don't, for me, I sort of more associate the Pat Gang with the 12th Doctor than the 11th, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's because they were there at the start. Maybe it's because you both, you've got the two Scots in charge. <laughs> mm. <laughs> what was it? But yeah, it does. Yeah. They do sort of feel more Capaldi than Matt Smith to me, even though they do spend more time with Matt Smith, and that's where they started out. But I suppose yeah. maybe that's just where I was at with the show as well. You know, I was sort of more tuning out a bit with the Matt Smith stuff, whereas here I was getting excited with a new Doctor. Uh, worked out well, but yeah. Hmm. So yeah, what about the clockwork droids coming back from a Girl in the Fireplace? It feels weird that we're getting to the point now where the new series can use its own nostalgia. Mm. Even though I know Day of the Doctor's literally won't glorify going, hey, here's the new series and, you know, celebrate the first eight years. But I, it's weird that we're going sort of, I wouldn't say deep cut for the new series, because I think Girl in the Fireplace is a popular It's a popular, episode. yeah, it is. Um, but I don't think the clockwork droids are necessarily a big part of that popularity, especially when this isn't using any of the iconography of the clockwork no, droids, is it? Very, it's very... not them, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, they are very different. They're the same idea again. This time, instead of fixing the ship, they're fixing themselves with human parts. But yeah, it is very different from how they're used in Girl in the Fireplace. But I do love, I love the concept of their use here, and they've got some great lines throughout it. I like yeah. all the makeup work for them. I think they, like you say, it really fits like the Victoriana body snatching era of like Burke and Hare. And like, you know, body, yeah, definitely body snatchers type feel to it all, really. Yeah, they are, they are very creepy, I will say. Yeah, I think the person who plays the half-face man does so well with like the robotic clockwork movement. Mm. The voices as well, it's nice that they're somewhat off-human. Oh, I loved the way he 
clips his hand onto his uh, toe yeah, as well. Like the way that went. Yeah, that was wonderfully yeah. done. And that's it's a nice little bit of comedy amongst the horror. I think that's something that tonally works. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, in terms of it being a Victoriana mystery, though, it doesn't quite work in that you know the mystery solved through an outside force. Yes. Like it's Missy giving them that hint. There's no game of cat and mouse here or anything. There's no investigation really. Yeah, you don't get any like actual human combustion people who witnessed it it's just all in that newspaper that's as much as you get of it i suppose human combustion might have been a step too far you've got the allusion to the half-faced man killing people i mean so that he's killed a lot of people with all the um skin in the balloon and such that's um, quite horrific i just thought that might be the dinosaur skin to be honest but they just use the optic nerve wasn't it yeah it's literally just the optic nerve right the fury from the doctor there that they burned a whole dinosaur just for its optic nerve. Mm. Yeah, that's good stuff. But yeah, so as a mystery, that doesn't really, the story doesn't really work because there is no mystery. You've got that whole on the other side thing. Um, and that's sort of a clever Moffat-ism, I suppose. Other than that, there's not really much mystery solving going on here. Mm-hmm. It does feel quite slow in that sense as well, in that it's a 75-minute episode, but it feels like the plot of a 45-minute one stretch, doesn't it? You've got a lot of long scenes here to more focus on Clara and the Doctor as characters. But in terms of actual plot, there's not really 75 minutes worth, I'd say. I think in in the nicest way possible, you, do you need those moments between the Doctor and Clara to establish a dynamic? Do you need as many of them? Yeah. I think Doesn't... I think so because I think for me that's where the story lies at its best. Mm. Between those just... two, yeah, I it's great seeing Peter and Jenna bounce off each other in those moments. Like have that whole control freak moment while they're sitting down looking at the menu was great. How <laughs> they... Clara thinks the doctor's talking about himself, then when she realizes he was actually talking about her, that's wonderful. And it's nice having that comedy from Peter Cowley's Doctor as well isn't it that he just doesn't care what other people think of him and he is insulting Clara a fair bit there which is quite um, I think therapeutic re- for us as well I think they're really trying to push the otherworldly nature of the Doctor because I think Matt's Doctor was quite a, a human but there was an alien edge where you know Capaldi you can see that there is a, a distance between him and mm. us if you know what I mean yeah, especially on early on in Series 8. I think by Series 10, it's much more the standard Doctor <clears throat> distance, isn't it? It's the yeah. alienness, but with a warmth to it. Because you get moments like when people are... T- where I usually sleep when people start talking and I usually wake up when it's my bit, you know, stuff like that. I, I forget how sharp 12's tongue is. Yeah. Um, which I like. Did you have anything more to say about the um, veil scene as well? Because we sort of spoke about that a bit in the synopsis, but you mentioned you weren't a fan <clears throat> of yeah. Clara in this episode, I suppose, the way it, the story uses her. Yeah, Clara is a character where if the story requires her to be something, she will be that. And this is probably the last time that is the case because Clara is accustomed to regeneration you know, two stories back, she met David Tennant and John Hurt. She's been through the Doctor's whole time stream. Surely she gets that regeneration is a key thing for this character to, to live on. Mm. But, yeah, she can't... Uh, yeah, I don't know whether it's emotional attachment or what, but surely she, she should be there for her friend. Even in the previous story, she saw... Matt Smith as an old man. Yeah, so he's like, well, a bit of a silver fox. Go on then. Yeah. It, it just sort of rubs me up the wrong way. Um, yeah, I know. It's, it's kind of doing like the end of time thing where, oh, it, it's trying to set Matt Smith for failure. Hmm. It's trying to set Capaldi up for failure, if, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I get what you mean. But at the same time, I feel like it's there to call out 
that side of you know the discourse isn't it really call out people who were <laughs> criticizing him for being an older doctor but it's at the detriment of clara yeah it is but hmm. yeah. it is yeah she does get a bit bitchy during those scenes with Vastra as well doesn't she hmm. like you know the way she says laughs at her saying renewed yeah which is a nice little throwback <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, it's the first time that's been used in a long while. Yeah. Ah. Uh, but I suppose it all comes back around to Clara, doesn't it? Because we get to see her get whacked in the face with a newspaper. I'm sensing you don't like Clara. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind her. I don't... Really? I don't dislike her as much as I used to, I guess. I okay, all right, okay. Hmm. I've, I've, I've come around a lot more on Jenna's performance. I think Jenna's fabulous. She's nice. doing a great job. Yeah. I think it is nice the way she sparks off of Capaldi in those early scenes. Mm. Mm. I mean, speaking of Capaldi, yeah. what, what do you make of him in this? He's brilliant in this, isn't he? Yeah. You're always glued to the screen when he's on, and it certainly is more entertaining with him around. He's very good at internalising, where mm. he's... There's a lot of subtext there for him, and you can see that he's working his way through it all, and it's great, great stuff, yeah. really. I I prefer how his Doctor turns out by Series 10, though. I think that's when you really get the Doctor with Capaldi. And also, he's an actor who was perfectly cast to be the Doctor, isn't he? I mean, when it comes to other Doctor's interpretations, it is sort of like an interpretation of the Doctor, isn't it? It's like, you know, David Tennant is very much the 10th Doctor. But some people are just the Doctor. Like, yeah, they it's... embody the character, and Capaldi has that otherworldly nature to him. Tom Baker, you could believe, is this being what wanders through eternity. Mm. Yeah, they both, from the classic new series, those are the two that really are just the Doctor perfectly. I mean, speaking of, like, what we're going about, people have a like similar facial structure him and capaldi tom baker and capaldi have a similar sort of face in a way of like big eyes big nose yeah they do don't they yeah oh, everything big attack yeah. eyebrows i mean i like that there's a there's a political edge about the scotland independence there of like eyebrows independence and all like you can see because yeah. that was a big thing in 2014 about the referendum and yeah mm. Mm. And had another referendum after that, which uh, yeah, less said about the better. Uh, but yeah, so like, there is a lot of um fun little bits that Moffat always like to sneak into the scripts, isn't there? Yes. Mm. So yeah, I suppose shall we rate this story now? Do you have any last bits to say on this one? Um, I like all the stuff about fa- the faces because like you've got mm. Brian Miller looking at himself and then you've got Capaldi no no not not Brian Miller the half face man looking at the yeah. the the sort of uh tray and you've got Capaldi looking finally seeing his face being formed and stuff which I think is quite a nice parallel between those two characters. Yeah um, it is I mean all that stuff on the um I'm um, not quite balloon but I suspect the yeah, restaurant, the restaurant balloon. floating. Yeah. Yeah. The sky, All that the sky restaurant, great. I guess. Yeah. Um yeah. Oh, I've, and... here's a question though. Oh, go for it. I think this is one of the big questions for this story. Do you think he was pushed or jumped? Ah, that's true. I've never really been too sure of it. I feel like he would have jumped just because of you basic know. programming. Yeah. Basically, just how we see the Doctor. Mm-hmm. But you never know. It's odd, isn't it? Because the Doctor can do things like push people out. I mean, Talons of Wing Triang, he very much shoves uh, Magnus Greel with some oomph into the organic distillation thing to kill him, doesn't he? And how the sick Doctor treats the Borans. You're ugly. Nobody loves you. Yeah. There's certainly bits like that, but you sort of see them as almost exceptions to the rule. And I feel like when it's deliberately being pointed out you see that the doctor will live up to that a bit more mm-hmm. yeah. what about you how do you interpret it pushed oh really that look afterwards says it all <laughs> yeah no, that's very true 
look yeah, to the I camera. I say pushed. Well. I say pushed. Uh -huh. Let us know what you think, whether our face was just like, I've had enough. You're right, mm. there's no promised land. Or what do you think? Capaldi's like, I've had enough of you, mate. Yeah. I'm almost surprised that Moffat never went back and did like a flashback. He loved his flashback scenes to reveal <clears> little bits. Like, I mean, we got one this episode with the uh, Matt Smith bit when Clara's back on Trent's Law, and we have uh, with Time of the Doctor itself, you know, you got the flashback into the room, don't you? Find out what the 11th yeah, Doctor's yeah. biggest God, fear God, is. God complex. God complex. Yeah. So I'm almost surprised Moffat never flashed back to this scene to reveal whether he was pushed or fell. I like that, though, that it does leave that up for interpretation. Mm -hmm. I guess that's one thing that sort of spirals off, am I a good man? There's got to be mm. something that sparks it, so, you know. Yeah. yeah lot of arc, a lot of arcs were being set up within this story. Promised mm. Land, why's he got that face? You know, and is he a good man? Can yeah. we trust this new doctor? How do you feel about the Matt Smith scene, by the way? Not the I, uh, fake face, the real Matt Smith. I, I like it because I think it's a nice... I think it's a better way of showing the audience holding their hand than going, he's old, I don't like him, what Clara mm. was doing. I think it's a better way of going, look, is he old? Oh, that's a shame. But it's still me. I think yeah. that's a better way of doing it than what the Clara scenes are trying to do. It's nice that it was left right until the end. Yes. Yes. Rather than overshadowing everything Capaldi does in this story, it gives him the chance before that comes along. I mean, it is a sad thing about Capaldi that his first and last stories are overshadowed by other Doctors. Yeah, that's true. He doesn't get a uh, regeneration episode to himself, does he, really? No. Hmm. But, yeah, I mean, we could talk about how we feel on that tomorrow, can't we, as well? Yes, we can. We can. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I could have probably done without the Matt Smith scene, but I don't mind it being here either. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm sort of take it or leave it on it. I can see why people are upset about it. I can also see why people enjoy it. I just more firmly in the middle with it, I guess. You're lukewarm. Huh? Yeah, there you go. Lukewarm. Uh, but am I lukewarm on this story with my rating? Oh, go on then. Give us a rating. I'll go seven. Uh, okay. Seven's a fair one for this. How about you? I'll go 7.5. Oh, there you have it. Yeah. I had fun with it. Yeah. It was a decent watch. Certainly dragged, but... I mean, you know, we, we're we Doctor Who fans. We're used to a bit of drag. We're used to a bit of padding. There, there you go. Uh, but tomorrow, we'll be diving into another big one, won't we? Because we have three episodes to tackle this time with World Enough and Time The Doctor Falls and finally Twice Upon a Time as Peter Capaldi takes his last bow as the Doctor mm. Yeah I think it, it, it'll work nice doing these three because you know the, the Sideman two part is the beginning of the regeneration and Twice Upon a Time is like a nice little epilogue isn't it yeah, that's it, really. I mean, we can we can further justify ourselves tomorrow with this choice of not just going for twice upon a time because I don't see him as a free parter, but I do think for the regeneration, it is all the regeneration story slash stories, I suppose. Yes, yes, mm. yeah. So join us tomorrow for that.